I spoke a short time ago with the independent MP, member for Warringah, Zali Stegall. I began by asking her how it felt to see this bill get the green light. I think this is a really important day. I think we need to celebrate the win in the sense that we have now legislated Australia's commitment to net zero by 2050 and a fairly clear pathway there. Um, I did have a number of negotiations with Chris Bowen around some of the language and trying to insert more specific budgeting periods. But I think, to be fair, there this is a positive first step in our journey to net zero. And... Yeah, it's, it's been a long journey since the climate change bills in 2020, but I think the government is recognising our communities want to move on and want a clear plan. Well, well um, let's be frank, a lot of your critics at the time would have said you were dreaming uh, to legislate that, and then now the wheel has turned quite dramatically yeah. and you are joined by not only your uh, neighbours in, in, in political thinking, but geographically, member for McKellar, North Sydney and, and others across the harbour and... Uh, Wentworth and, and, we know, in Melbourne as well, a couple of seats. So this is something where it has certainly captured the mood of the electorate in this election year, didn't it? Absolutely. When I ran in 2019, it was a commitment to Warringah to be a climate leader, to put forward some sensible solutions to try and stop the divisive politics around climate change policy. Um, putting forward that legislation opened, I think, the discussion to what was needed. And at the time, neither major parties were committed to net zero by 2050. So we have, in the course of those three years, moved both major parties Parties to that commitment. Um, now, obviously, Labor in government is com has committed to legislating and they have worked with us to make sure it is good legislation. Um, it's surprising that the coalition is still digging their heels in and holding on to the past. Only Bridget Archer crossed the floor to vote for the climate, the amended climate bill this morning. That, that can't be an easy thing to do for a, a member of a major party to to cross the floor, but she would be... There'd be others in her party with similar views. We know in the Senate, certainly, a number of them have said that they are pleased that their leader have said they'll be more ambitious ahead of the next election. So it seems there is some change there as well, albeit not today. Well, it's interesting, though, because Bridget Archer was already the very courageous one in the last parliament, where she really stood up for her principles and views, and she did cross the floor on important issues like climate... Uh, well, sorry, not in that, in that parliament, but she did cross the floor on integrity, for example. Um, and I would argue the Liberal members, especially my neighbours up in Sydney, that lost their seats, the main criticism was that those communities did not feel heard. They did not feel that their vote counted because despite talking about caring about climate, they weren't prepared to vote for it. Mm. Um, and so I think there is a very clear message to the coalition that at federal level, it is out of touch with community expectations. On some of the, the goals here, or the targets, so the 43% target is accompanied also by a broader renewable target of 82% by 2030. What do you say to critics uh, within the coalition and elsewhere that that can't be achieved with our current energy system? Uh, look, I disagree. I took a five steps to net zero plan to the election where I had uh, modelled and worked with experts and got briefings and made sure it was a possible plan to get to 80% renewables by 2030. So I do support that that is a very achievable ambition. Um, it requires a prompt transition. It requires investment into uh, the transition network. Uh, it needs to good collaboration with state governments as well, because remembering in New South Wales we have renewable energy zones uh, and we have a lot more ambition at state government level. And so we need to make sure federal government is working with state governments. On, on those transmission networks and so on, those sceptical of the target would point to, and do point to, uh, Europe, Germany and others that are having to backtrack on ambitious goals. The big difference, I would say, Europe does not have access to renewable energy the way Australia does. They do not have the amount of sunshine, wind or space that we have. So we are absolutely well positioned to be leaders here. They are envious of our opportunity. Um, so I do think this is where we need to go. Uh, we know cost of living is biting and we can't address cost of living if we don't address climate impacts because fuel, food, insurance, all of these aspects of cost of living are impacted by climate events. Were you pleasantly surprised at the level of collaboration that 
you were afforded, not just you, but your counterparts on the crossbench. And today we saw a number of amendments agreed to by the government. Oh, absolutely. And um, could I say, a lot of work went into that. Obviously, that's been a very detailed process over the last three weeks, since seeing the first draft to the draft to then the bill that was tabled to then amendments that were moved today. There has been a lot of work and meetings and discussions around uh, each, each one's position. Um, and I think it shows a whole group of independents can work well collectively, sensibly. Uh, there was no chaos in the parliament. We weren't creating, uh, you know, it, it wasn't too difficult. And the government was uh, incredibly receptive. And I have to say, you know, Chris Bowen was very good in wanting to have that dialogue and wanting to make sure um, that the legislation was as good as it could be. And he has indicated he wants to continue working on the, the other legislation that needs to come. And when you obviously represent a former Liberal seat and your counterparts, the, the, the Teal Independents, represent Liberal, traditional Liberal seats, your success was largely due to your response on climate, as you, as you alluded to earlier. How do you now... This is legislated... Not, not reinvent, but mm. what's your focus now? Uh, we have ticked this box. Where to now? Well, it wasn't just one issue. I think the position on climate took the attention of the media, maybe, and sort of was sort of the headline issue. But my community knows I'm incredibly committed to uh, business to ensure, and also in our transition on climate, that it's a sensible transition. That this isn't a, you know, we have to do this fiscally responsibly with good investment, making sure communities take, uh, you know, all move along. So. There is that trust, I think, in the mandate from my community to make sure I am working for good opportunities around innovation, research and development, so that business prospers. Um, I think Warringah is an electorate of, you know, strong business ethics and they want to see those priorities. So it's um, ticking off legislating climate does not deal with climate. We have to maintain vigilance that the government is delivering what it says it will deliver. And as an independent, I am well placed to continue requiring accountability of the government. And Wilkie, uh, Andrew Wilkie and the Greens went for a lot more ambition in their amendments. Why did you not back those amendments? Well, they moved amendments to legislate 75% uh, by 2030 and net zero by 2035. Now, the Climate Council and a number of other scientific bodies have indicated a range of emissions ambition necessary to stay to as close to 1.5, and that range is actually 60 to 75%. So I would argue I took 60% to, to the election because I was satisfied I had a plan that could deliver and achieve that target. I am not satisfied that there is a clear mechanism or plan on how those targets could be achieved. So I feel they are a little too ambitious and too fast and we would leave some communities behind. And finally, in that context, do you think that critics of the independents who link you to the Greens are misreading your approach to uh, politics? I think they are. Obviously, the Greens have their own mandate and, and their own style. I think I represent much more the sensible centre, which wants to see a uh, planned, uh, reasonable transition, acknowledges the seriousness of climate change and global warming, the need to transition, but the desire to do so in a fiscally responsible way. Zali Stegall, appreciate your time. Thanks. Thank you.